When I was a medical student, um, it was a very strange experience because when I would go into the clinic and go onto the wards and talk to patients about their lives, talk to them about their feelings, I would come back to my attending professors and tell them about what I had learned about how a person was struggling with their illness, and they would tell me that that was not what doctors were supposed to do, that you weren't supposed to talk to people about the stories of their lives or talk about their thoughts or their feelings. And I tried as best as I could as a young person to fit into that system, and ultimately I had to stop school because I couldn't see a way of being in a world that seemed so focused on, as they said, just the physical. So I took some time off from school, a year, and when I came back, it didn't really change that much. I tried my best, but still, the medical world lacked something I couldn't even articulate, some way of seeing that thoughts and feelings were as real as blood and hearts and brains. When I later went into psychiatry, uh, this struggle between the physical world and the mental world continued. And there were statements that the brain was the main thing and the mind was just the activity of the brain. And that things that you could hold in your hand were real, but things like thoughts and feelings weren't really something that was anything more than just neuronal activity. So when I started seeing patients in the 1980s, I coined this term called mindsight to try to embrace some way where we actually see the mind as something that's real. And over the years, mindsight has become an organizing principle, a way of really thinking about how the mind itself works and how we can bring mental health into our lives. When I was first a trainee in psychiatry, I was amazed that we never talked about the mind. And in trying to work with a group of scientists to explore the nature of the brain and how it connected with this thing we didn't have a definition of, of the mind, I was amazed that the different disciplines couldn't really speak with each other. So in coming up with a working definition of at least a part of what the mind is as a regulatory process that shapes energy and information flow, it became really useful to work with people in my clinical practice because once it was defined as regulatory, then it had to involve two fundamental processes. When you regulate a car, for example, you have to be able to perceive where you're going or monitor where you're going, and you have to be able to modify what you're doing with the car, to steer the car. So in helping people develop their minds, it became useful to first to have them develop the ability to monitor the internal world, thoughts, feelings, behavioral impulses, perceptions, memories, everything that you can imagine that our mental lives involve, you can actually improve the capacity to sense that. That's the first part of mindsight. But the second part is the modifying part. And people often don't get the skills to actually modify this energy and information flow, the way in which they're thinking and feeling and remembering things. So mindsight became a word to embed not only the perceptual part, but also the modifying part. So it really became a way of strengthening the mind, because the mind, once it could be defined as a regulatory process, could be strengthened when we could see exactly what its components were. Now, I was shocked when I interviewed in public settings over 80,000 mental health practitioners to find that less than 5% of mental health professionals around the world had ever had even a single lecture defining the mind. And even in other fields that work with the mind, it's often something that's not defined. So what we do in the mindsight approach is to actually take the step of making a working definition of the mind and then directly strengthening the mind by building the monitoring and modifying ability of the individual so that their mind is empowered to not just be a passive passenger along the path of life, 
but actually to be an active participant and the active author of the person's own unfolding life story.